member of a TIFF call. Um, so many people uh, in queue, I want to address you guys to the Q&A on the bottom of your screen. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, you have that. There are point in the presentation. Feel free to ask me a question, um, and I will make sure that we get it answered by one of our brands. So today, we are joined by a group of franchise executives from many different backgrounds, um, including the Goddard School, Anna Go. We do lunch right at home, Rainbow International, um, which is a part of the wire group, Wireless Zone. And then, as always, um, I'm joined by um, a whole bunch of franchise executives uh, who are on the supplier side, uh, SMB Franchise Advisors, Franchise Works, and Gordon and Reese, um, which I'll lean on them for some expert opinion. Again, the best way that, that these webinars work is when it's interactive and um, you guys ask questions, so keep that in mind uh, as we sift through this. Um, just quick introductions. Uh, Nick Powell's. I'm the CEO of No Limit Media Consulting. We are a PR and social media agency um, that works with franchise brands. Um, the reason uh, we do these webinars is so that we can educate you guys and get you guys uh, up to speed and understanding some of the art of uh, what is franchising, what is uh, behind it, some additional features to help you guys feel comfortable in the process as you go down the line. Um, we put these on almost every single month, so you can always go to our virtual franchise roundtable Facebook page to find out information on the next webinar. Um, and you can always um, email me, which you'll see my contact information at the bottom, um, if you want to have um, some insight or need to be connected um, to one of the franchisors on today's panel. I'm um, also joined by Steve Beagleman. Steve, do you want to give a little introduction on your brand? Steve. Hello. Go uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Beagleman, and I'm the founder of SMB Franchise Advisors. We're a franchise consulting firm that helps people franchise their concept and also helps existing franchise systems put better processes and systems in place. been in the franchise industry for over 25 years, helping as a senior executive build such brands as Rita's Water Ice, Salad Works, and Hollywood Tans. Be here today. That's great, Steve, and we're going to come back to you in a second. Um, Steve is a great contact, especially on the franchisor side, so if we have any franchisors that are listening, um, Steve's excellent at uh, providing some great advice on pretty much every point of franchise um, system. So, um, again, contact information, if you look under the photos or the photos, you'll see that everyone's contact information. That's there so that you guys can communicate afterwards. This is more than just educational. It's also networking. Um, I'm joined by Terry from Franchise Works. Terry, do you want to give a quick uh, elevator speech on Franchise Works? I've been imagining since 1987, but our website really is a uh, information portal where you can get, you know, obviously find information on hundreds of different companies, uh, updated news information, anything about franchising typically is on the site, so it's something you can access and, and kind of do your homework. Thanks. We'll come back to you again in a second. Um, also, we're joined by Harold from Gordon Reese. Harold, do you want to give the elevator speech on Gordon Reese? Good, good, good morning, everybody. My name is Harold Kestenbaum. I'm a franchise attorney. Uh, I uh, am a partner in the uh, national law firm Gordon Reese. We have uh, 25 offices around the country, uh, over 450 attorneys. I specialize in representing franchises on the transactional side, and I've been doing this now for over 35 years. I wrote a book called How, to Fran How You Want to Franchise Your Business, which is basically a how-to book on how to franchise your business, and if you have any questions on the legal side, I am here to help. Yeah, and Harold, we're going to lean you on uh, some questions uh, throughout the webinar, so we'll get back to you in a second. Okay. Um, just some quick uh, house, housing rules. Uh, one, uh, use our Facebook fan page. It's there for you guys to see afterwards. Uh, you can ask for the questions. You can interact with us on there. Um, make sure you like the page. Uh, it should have, when you registered, sent you directly to it. Um, and when we end the webinar, it will send you uh, directly to it as well. Um, if you click on the speakers within the um, within the webinar, you can also uh, connect with them on LinkedIn and email um, through the Power of Facebook. So make sure you have that. 
Uh, LinkedIn is another great place that you can interact and uh, communicate with our franchise. Um, so be sure to uh, connect with us on LinkedIn. Emails, like I said, at the bottom of everyone's photo, you'll see someone's email address. Um, this is an opportunity to connect and network afterwards. Uh, use our Facebook page to um, obviously find information on the next roundtable. Uh, these are, are these are forward moving. So the idea is that you guys can listen to these quick hour webinars, ask your questions, connect, help you decide if franchising is right for you or what brand makes sense for you. Um, so they're progressive. So every fran every roundtable is different. So make sure that you keep these on your calendar and keep looking out for them. Um, if you did, sir, um, we do have your email address, so we can always send it to you afterwards, too. And we see that Q&A feature. Uh, make sure that you're using our roundtable uh, friend site um, on Facebook, as well as the feature in the lower right-hand corner so that we can get your questions answered. Um, so as we quickly get into this, um, I want to make some introductions to the franchise brands that are on our call, just so that you guys have a quick uh, brief history on them. Um, this isn't a selling webinar. This is an educational webinar, but I figure it's important for everyone who's listening to get a little bit of an umbrella story on each of the brands. So, um, Diane, are you on the call today? I am. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Well, good morning to everyone there. My name is Diane Huffer, and I'm with Right at Home. We're a senior home care company. We provide services so that seniors can stay in their home. Um, we have over 220 offices in the United States today, and we're also international. And um, I've owned a franchise myself for four or five years, and before that I was in corporate America for 20 years. So I think I have a background that probably reflects a lot of yours out there. So thank you for joining yeah. us today. And I'm going to have Diane on here exactly for that reason, because she's walked in your guys' shoes. Um, and, in fact, a lot of franchisors have. So part of this, and, and, again, it's about the networking behind it, even if right at home is not the brand that you're ready to make a decision on, um, connect with Diane, because she can probably provide you some insight. And I know, I mean, that's the nice thing about the people who are on our webinar. Everyone is more than happy to help and, and help you guys navigate it. It is tough as a franchise product aspect to get through everything that's out there, everything on the web, all the information that's flying away. And from here is here's some great people that you guys can connect with, even outside of their brand, to say, hey, I have a question about the process. Can you help me on it? Um, also, we're joined by Chris Corey. Chris, are you on the line? Uh, yeah, I'm on the call, Nick. Thank you. Good morning. Chris, you want to give a quick uh, history on We Do Line? Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Chris Corey, uh, president and founder of We Do Lines Parking Lot Striping, the nation's leading parking lot striping franchise, fast going off the radar industry, and we've established in a short amount of time a very powerful and recognizable brand in the unbranded industry. Not a lot of people think of parking lot lines. We did, so a great market and opportunity, and I'm uh, very fortunate to have recruited some uh, extremely strong candidates and franchise prospects into our system to help grow and develop our brand, ultimately to accomplish our you know, of, uh, become a nation of leading lot striping company. And just so you guys know, if you are looking at the screen and not just listening, again, we have a crazy number of attendees today, um, you'll see a picture. And Chris is there in the middle, um, but that was a feature in Entrepreneur Magazine, so obviously they had a little fun with the photo. So thanks for joining us, Chris. Um, Tony Padula, are you on the call this morning? Uh, how are you, You're Nick? Good morning. How are you? Uh, terrific. Yourself? I'm good. So, Tony, I want you to give introductions. One, yourself, because you have a wealth of information, which is even if you weren't connected to the Goddard School, you would definitely be someone that we would want on the webinar. Um, so you personally, and then obviously on the Goddard School as well. Well, uh, as Nick said, I'm Tony Padulo. I'm Vice President of Franchise Development for the Goddard Schools. I've been in franchise development for over 30 years. Uh, most of my career was spent at Dunkin' Donuts and Baskin Robbins for 22 years. I was their Vice President of Development. I handled both domestic as well as international development. Probably opened about 35 new countries for, for both brands uh, across the world. And after Dunkin' Donuts, I did did some work with BP Oil on the West Coast and developing a franchise concept for them on our 
can you store chain? So we had a chain, a, a company owned chain called Connect Stores, which was the uh, eastern counterpart of the western of the western states where we called AMP that some of you may recognize the name, and, and BP is now franchising that they had uh, at the time over 600 units. And in addition to that, I've worked at um, uh, Genus, which was a regional um, developer, or franchisor, I should say, in the Northeast. And prior to coming here to Goddard Schools, I was uh, VP of Development at Amco Transmissions. So, so the question you might ask is, Boy, you know, like it, it's a span of different concepts from food to oil to uh, transmissions and now childcare. But from my perspective, the principles of franchising are always the same. I mean, if you have a solid, if you're working with a solid franchise or a solid concept, those processes, those concepts follow the same basic philosophies. At the Goddard School, is very happy to be here. Been here since December of 2010. Um, and we are, you know, the leading franchise child care uh, concept in the U.S. We currently have 487 schools throughout the U.S. We're currently in 35 states. We have not started developing international yet, but that is on our longer range uh, of forecast. But there's just so much room to grow still in the U.S. Uh, would God. So as we get into the uh, into the seminar, I know we'll be addressing some specific points. So I'll, I'll wait for that. Yep. All right. Thanks, Tony. We appreciate that. Um, can John Doug Dixon, are you on the call this morning? Hi, good morning, Nick. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you? So good. Doug has, um, obviously, we, we see that he's representing Rainbow International, but Doug, I want you to go into the Dwyer Group as well, um, and if you could just touch on briefly some of the history with even programs like VetPran, that would be that would be great to touch on here. Sure. Uh, again, my name is Doug Dixon. I'm Vice President of Marketing and Operations and Franchise Development Area of the Dwyer Group. Uh, our group's been around for about 30 years now, so we have a long history in franchising. And, and we're both seven different brands, all in the services industry. And those brands are Mr. Rooter, which does uh, plumbing work. Uh, Mr. Appliance is appliance repair. Mr. Is electrical contracting. Collector's glass replacement and repair. AirServe, which does um, ADAC work. Grouse is uh, our landscape lawn maintenance uh, organization. And then last. Rainbow National, um, which uh, does restoration work. Uh, seven brands, we've got about 1,600 uh, units uh, throughout North America and Europe. And all of them are in the services industry, so we get some great synergies across those brands. They're uh, all needed and repetitive, service, repetitive services and uh, service a broad span across residential and commercial customer base. Um, uh, Rainbow specifically, which is the one that we'll be talking about today, uh, we have uh, 400 units um, uh, in operation. Um, added 51 last year, so we're growing nicely. And uh, again, uh, we do restoration work, which is cleanup of fire, smoke, water damage, that sort of thing, putting uh, people back together after they've had some sort of a, uh, uh, a uh, issue with an uh, with a, uh, emergency like that. Um, as far as uh, vet brand, uh, Nick asked me to talk about that. Uh, our founder, Don Dwyer, was uh, one of the uh, driving forces behind the creation of VetFran. And uh, VetFran um, is an organization that uh, is targeted to bring our veterans into uh, into franchising. And um, I think there are 400 companies that are members of uh, the VetFran Alliance at this point and uh, offering different types of benefits for veterans as they join uh, as an organization. We offer a 25% discount off of a base uh, fran franchise fee for coming into uh, the Dwarf Group franchises. That's great. Thanks Thanks for that, Doug. And obviously, you get to come on as, as a lot of global opinions as we dive into this, um, both representing the Dwarf Group and even your previous background, too. So we're happy to have you on. <coughs> Chris Cunningham, are you on the call this morning? Yes, I am. Hi, Nick. Good morning. How are you? Good. Do you want to give some background on yourself and the wireless zone as well? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Chris Conley. I'm from Wireless Zone Franchise. We are a Verizon wireless premium seller. So basically, in a nutshell, what we do is we help people that want to get into the uh, business uh, to sell Verizon wireless products and service, products, product services, sorry. And, uh, you know, we, we help them find a location. We do all the training, marketing support, uh, warehousing, uh, customer service, everything it takes to open up and run a store 
uh, is what we bring to bring to the table. We are close to 500 locations, or we're closing in on 500 locations. We are mainly uh, east of the Mississippi. It kind of drifts a little bit when we get out uh, down to the south a little bit, but uh, looking to grow. That's great. Thanks, that, Chris, and we'll come back to you in a second. And we're also joined by Judy Walker. Judy, are you on the call this morning? Yeah, I am. Hi, Nick. Good morning. How are you? Good, thank you. Do you want a little bit of background on yourself and Anago as well? Sure. Um, my name is Judy Walker. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Amigo Cleaning Systems. I have been with the company for just under 18 years um, in different capacities. We started franchising in 1991, and I came on shortly after that. Um, we have 30, we're a two-tier franchise system. We have 33 master territories across the United States and one international in Santiago, Chile. Um, I have been involved in the sale, training, and support of every master that we have. And um, it's a, we're a commercial cleaning uh, franchise. Uh, the commercial cleaning in the U.S. is a one, over $100 billion a year industry uh, and has proven to be very recession resistant. So the experience significant growth in the past few years and expect to this year as well, despite the current economic climate. Um, and won numerous awards, uh, have been consistently ranked as one of the fastest growing in the U.S. Um, because we're, we're doing so well despite the economy. As I mentioned, a two-tier franchise system, so those 33 master territories across the U.S., we have over 2,000 unit franchisees coming out of those 33 masters, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Thanks, Nick. That's great. Thanks, Judy. All right, so now what everyone's been waiting for, let's get into the round table. We like taking about the first 20 minutes of our webinar so that we can go through the introductions, and then we can pound it into it. So we're going to go through five categories, five questions that would fun to what makes a great brand, what, what should we be looking for in great brand, and that's kind of the theme of today because there's obviously concepts and there's brands, and but we want to understand what elements fall into that. Why should I be buying a franchise now? So, again, use the Q&A feature. We have a few that have popped up, um, and we'll make sure we get, get those answered. Um, but why franchising now? Identify franchise and the characteristics. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So question number one, how do I decide on the right industry for me? And this is figuring out brand would fit into these industries. So I want I want my panel to talk about the brands and, and how they fit into the industry and how you pick the right industry and how how what what am I looking for in the company that I that I do. So um, like we've done in the past, I'm gonna have several of our franchisors answer these questions and then um, as well as our experts on the call. And obviously you guys can ask follow up questions, but we're gonna treat this almost like it's a round table. So everyone keep your answers pretty quick and then we'll uh, keep going through it. So why don't we start with you, uh, Diane. Why don't you answer the question, how do I decide on the right industry for me? And then secondly, how does Right at Home fit into uh, being a great brand within your industry? Okay. Well, well first of all, um, I've been through this exercise myself, so I can, I can tell you um, what, what I looked at and what I think others that look at Right at Home looks, like, looks at is what is interesting to you. Um, what experiences have you had in your background? What do you like to do um, versus what do you not like to do? Um, people tend to gravitate towards those, um, you know, those industries or those types of jobs that they're good at and that they like. And um, keep in mind when you get into this industry or into a business, those areas that you don't like, you can, as an owner, you can hire people people to compensate for your weaknesses or those things that you don't like to do. So, so for instance, um, I, I like to cook, and so one of my previous businesses that I looked at was something that had to do with food, um, retail, retail food. That was interesting. And then um, my father-in-law came down with Alzheimer's, and so the senior care market was very interesting to me, high growth, and so that's why I've gravitated towards working here at Right at Home. Uh, and that's why a lot of our franchisees gravitate that because they've had um, experiences in their life 
with elder care. Uh, so, so you have to look at the experiences in your life. You have to look at those things that are interesting to you. You have to look at those things that you think are going to maintain a, a lifestyle that you're used to maintaining and look for business that will help you do all that. So those are the things that I look for when I'm looking at an industry. And what about you, Chris? What what would you look at in, in industry? Chris Corey. Sure, thanks, Nick. Um, I agree with that, and I, I think that you know, self-assessment is, is a great first step to, to look at and see your strengths and, and weaknesses may lie. Um, can you see, you know, see yourself participating in this specific industry for this specific brand? Uh, very important, you know, service brand uh, product. It's a product industry. Um, the B to B to C factors. I think those are also very, very important. Hours of operation. Um, you know, position marketplace. Analyze each brand in terms of first to mid. Uh, the overall competitive landscape. I think you know. Do you want to be in an existing established brand? Look for a younger, newer brand. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of those questions, I think, are, are very important to look at. Uh, but ultimately, how do they all match up with your skill set and desires? You know, I, I, I think Dan was wrong with that. that, that that's essentially uh, a, a big piece of that. that that's what's going to drive this and, and help you build the business for yourself and accomplish the goals that you are looking to accomplish. That's great. And Tony, so obviously once you pick the right industry for you, and, and that's that's starting at the top of the umbrella. You're saying, I want to be in senior care. I want to be in child care. I want to be in parking lot striping. I want to be in the, the, the cell phone segment. When you when you pick the industry, what would you look for in the brands? What what helps brands differentiate themselves once you're kind of one piece down um, into the industry and you've identified? What should you be looking for in the brand? I think the first thing that you're looking for, Nick, when you're Look, assuming you've already picked the industry and you're pretty comfortable and that's what you want to do, you have to look at the the brand in terms of of, of its recognition, in terms of its uh, um, appeal, overall appeal, and where does it stand? I mean, is is a leader in its in its segment? Is it an up and coming? Uh, you know, what are you looking for? So, for example, if you're a franchise or a franchisee that tends to be a little bit more adventuresome. Uh, maybe a little bit more entrepreneurial. You may want to look at a brand that is uh, uh, more of an emerging brand. On the other hand, you're at a point in your life where a brand's lifestyle is more important, or you're really looking for a brand that has a proven track record, has has a mature uh, uh, stability. Then you're looking at you know wh- where are the leaders in uh, or who are the leaders in that segment. So I, so I think you have to look at that. And then once you've zoned in on or zeroed in on the brand, look, look at it carefully in terms of how has it been performing over the last few years. You look at it both from uh, historical, you know, how many units does it grow, has it been growing per year, uh, what are the average sales of those units, uh, are those uh, unit sales increasing every year, or are they stagnant because of growth? Sometimes if you just look at growth, it's not necessarily provide you a full picture. So you really want to look at both growth as well as unit sales. And then, as importantly, get a good sense of where that company is looking to grow and what are the plans for growth. Because you may be at a very mature stage, franchise may be at a very mature stage in their life cycle where there might not be a lot of opportunities uh, uh, So, for example, when you look at, at, uh, at the Goddard schools, you know the re, uh, the interesting thing about us is that a large proportion of our franchisees actually come from parents who have their children in their schools in our schools, and they have been so um, wowed by our concept and by the approach we use to to, to early learning or childcare that they you know first they say oh, gee, I didn't realize it was a franchise, and then gee I like the concept so much. Let me find out about it. So really, those are some of the areas that you're looking at. That's great. Do you have to have passion for the industry, or do you have to have a passion for business when deciding what, what industry is for you? And it's interesting because as my previous panelists were speaking, I was thinking to myself, if I pa- asked every one of our, our franchisees, um, did you ever see yourself in the commercial cleaning industry? I think every one of them would say no. Um, 
it's it's basically a journey that you're on, and you have to really look deep inside and see um, where are your strengths, where are your weaknesses, what are you passionate about, and it may not be that you're passionate about cleaning, but passionate about helping people, about monitoring people, about mentoring people, about taking people on the road to business ownership, and that's exactly how they found us and how they found Anago Cleaning Systems. Being a two-tiered franchise system, the master franchisor in the territory is selling unit franchises to people looking to open a, a cleaning business and the American dream of business ownership. So not only is there the um, satisfaction financially of owning a master franchise, but there's a lot of personal satisfaction involved in it as well because they're really mentoring people on a journey towards business ownership and helping them to succeed in business. So it, it's, as I said, it's something that maybe you don't initially see and, and you really need to have a good idea of what you love to do in, in life, what look at your past skills and what jobs you've had that, that you really loved doing and what were your responsibilities during that time and what do you feel strong about um, about doing going forward. So, Diane, I want to go back to you because, you know, in your career is kind of boomed. It's really a, a hot, hot topic, a hot, a hot franchise uh, category. Um, how do brands differentiate themselves? I mean, is there a way they can and and if I'm a prospect, I'm looking at this very full uh, segment. How how do brands differentiate themselves with, within an industry? Well, first of all, what's nice about franchising is it's a proven concept. Um, for instance, we have 220 locations, so we've helped people get up and running, you know, 220 times. So, you know, um, you get to the point where you get very good at helping your brands get up and running and help to differentiate them. And with differentiation, you're looking at the training. You know, this brand, are they very good at training their franchisees to compete in the market? Uh, are they teaching these franchisees, um, you know, on how to do their sales and to get referrals to bring business in the door. Um, also, with differentiation, you're looking at, you know, the satisfaction of the customers. If you do a really good job, a lot is word of mouth out there on the street. So you want to make sure you're training your franchisees as well as you can to provide the best service that they can. And, th and that, you know, it's the adage, you know, if someone's satisfied, they're going to tell, you know, one or two other people. If they're not, they're going to tell ten people. So you need to make sure that, you know, so with with your training that you you know really push the you know the customer satisfaction, and, and that's the big differentiator here. Um, you know with with elder care people you know are very they they just don't want to leave their relatives their mom or dad with just anybody. It needs to be with a trusted source. So so that's part of the differentiation to be the best provider that's out there in the market, and that will drive a lot of referrals that are out there. Uh, thanks for that, Diane. Okay, so we're going to come back to all all of the folks who are on that question in a second, but I want to keep cranking through. Let's get to the next question. What are some elements of the FDD that, that can influence my decision? And I want you guys to talk about this as as a brand. Like, like as a brand, what are you putting in there, and what as a franchisee should I be looking at? Um, Steve, I want to start with you um, because you, I mean, you you've walked franchisees through this on um, the franchisor side. You've helped franchisees understand how to make their FDD stronger. Um, why don't you start off by taking the first question? What are some elements of FDD that can inf help influence my decision? Well, if you're a potential franchisee and you're looking at a, a business opportunity or a franchise opportunity, Nick. The FDD can be a little overwhelming if you've never investigated a franchise before. It's this big document with a whole bunch of things in it, all these different items, sections. Um, but the most important things that you really want to look at are obviously uh, the background history of the company. Uh, you certainly want to look at who the officers are of the organization and who are the people that are going to be running this company. And, and you know, I'm investing a lot of money in this franchise. Uh, Startup costs. Uh, so what is it going to cost me to open one of these locations or one of these businesses? And then typically you want to look at something called an item 19 to see if a franchisor has what's called um, an earnings claim 
uh, or financial representation. So, you know, some franchisors offer that. A lot of them on the phone call today I know do have an item 19. Um, so that gives you some kind of an idea of revenue expectations, sometimes costs that you look at when you're looking at a franchise business, as well as the financials of the franchisor. So you certainly want to be able to look at that as well. So those are probably the main sections that you want to look at. We're looking at an FDD document and certainly communicate with your franchisor because they'll be able to help guide you through the FDD document and explain different sections of it to you. Okay, and let's go on over to the attorney. Harold, do you want to give some pointers or some tips on into that FDD? Well, I think there are a couple of other sections that needs that, that a franchisee needs to focus on. Uh, and I, I, I particularly point to number three, item three, which is litigation. It may not apply to a startup franchise company because they're brand new, but existing franchisors, if, they, if there are you know numbers and scores of litigation against them, you might want to know why that's the case. Uh, you know, when a franchisee starts suing the franchisor, there's got to be some issues that, that are, are hidden, so you've got to find out what they all are. Uh, five and six are, are what you're going to pay up front and what you're going to be ongoing. And when you're sitting down with your accountant, figuring out you know, your budget, you know what it's going to cost you every week or every month in terms of royalties, uh, advertising, et cetera. So those are important. And, and yeah, Stephen's right, 19, if there is one, is important. We'll also look at have your lawyer focus on item 17, which is default termination. See what is, if you do wrong, you could lose your business. Because that, that could be important. And, and you might not think that's something to do is inconsequential, but, but the reality is it's, it may be a, an item of default that, that could be curable or, 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 or something that, that could be bad and your business. So those are important. And, and lastly, Take the financial statements because, you know, for, for a franchisor that's undercapitalized, where you may be putting up more money than they have in the bank, you got to scratch your head for a second. Now, that could be the case for established franchisors, but it's certainly the case for startups. Because you'll see some startups with $50,000 in the bank where the investment's going to be a half a million dollars. So you as a buyer need to scratch your head and say, wait a minute, why, why am I spending more money than they have in the bank? So those are those are things I don't look for. Yeah, that's great advice, Harold. So I, I have a question for you. If I'm a franchise prospect on the call today, and we, we have a lot of them, um, should I expect the franchisor to help me understand what I'm looking for in FTD, or do I need to go find an attorney? I have a, a picture. You really first need to find a franchisee attorney who could do through this. And then when you have questions and you want to go deeply into the business, then you want to talk to the franchisor or their representative. Uh, so, for example, how come you have four lawsuits? you want to tell me about that? Or things like that. The, the, the attorney's not going to be able to tell you, but the franchisor will. I mean, a lot of those, when, when we go back to the theme of the great characteristics of a, of a brand, you can find a lot about a brand by, by really dissecting the FDD. Yes, and <clears throat> so again, when you were looking at FDDs as a franchise prospect, what were you looking for? Do you have any tips for the for the franchise prospects on today's call? Sure. Um, I was looking at the franchise fee and the royalty structure. Uh, I also wanted to know the term. Um, you know, how long is this agreement for, and can I transfer this franchise to someone else during that term if I want to sell my business? So that was. A important to me. And then also, are there some minimum revenue requirements? Um, am I required to produce a certain amount of revenue in a certain period of time? So I wanted to be aware of all of that when I was looking at that. Um, also, you know, again, the performance claims. There are a lot of franchise systems that don't make performance, financial performance claims in, in the franchise document, and I think that tells you something if they're not willing to put that in there. So that was important to me. Uh, and um, just uh, I wanted to know a lot about the owners and their experiences, and again, the litigation, and if they've been you know, sued by their franchisees in the past. So, so those are all very important to me. And then the financials. You know, look at the audited financials in the back because that tells you a lot about you. You want a franchise organization that's going to be out for the long term. You know, if 
it's a 10-year term, you want to make sure that that company is going to be there with advertising for that 10-year term because you're investing in it. So make sure that there's strong financials. And then at back, I mean, I, I wanted to see the listing of franchisees that they have. Um, and, and I'd like an extensive list of franchisees that I can call and see how they like the system. So, so that was very important to me as well. Great. So also, you've worked with a lot of brands. I mean, from a brand side, what elements of the FDD are you trying to to chase? I mean, what what are the best elements for you uh, with with Goddard School, but but also as a whole, if you want to kind of swing at all the brands that you've worked with and what franchisees should be looking at. I, I mean, so far, Nick, all of the points that have been raised are absolutely right on. I mean, those are all you know, the questions that, that the candidate should be looking at and, and looking for answers from the franchisor. In my experience in uh, in every brand I've, I've been with, assuming all of the other areas are are are, are looking well, uh, the, you know, to the, to the candidate, the most important questions always come down to how much is this going to cost me, uh, what kind of revenues can I expect, and how much am I going to make? And I know those are always hard questions to answer. But consistently, uh, those franchisors, and, and I've been lucky, all the ones I've worked with, we have all included 19. And I say that, you know, with all of my experience, my over 30 years, the item 19 that we have here at Goddard Schools, I have never seen such a comprehensive uh, item 19 where we actually list the, the revenue of every school in our system. So all 400 and what's the year before, but, you know, some 450 these schools, uh, not only do we list them, but, but we we actually list, and of course we don't identify them specifically. You know, they're all listed uh, anonymously, but the, they're listed by revenues, by major expenses, and uh, and EBITDAs, uh, which is the earnings before interest, uh, taxes, depreciation, amortization, so that it gives the candidate. A sense, you know, because averages only tell you one side of the picture. Average sales, especially if they're on a national level, there, there, there are so many regional and and even local differences that's hard if you're just looking at a, a national average. It, it, the, the range can be enormous. So by having as much of that information available it really helps you. And then we go one step further. We actually list based on previous year how long it's it takes average new schools to reach break-even point. And that's an important factor, too, because like any other investment, it's not just about investment, but you know that any business you start up, there is a normal ramp-up time. So you have to make sure that you budget enough enough working capital for that, and you have a, a realistic expectation. You know, is it uh, 12 months? Is it 18 months? Is it 6 months? And that you're not expecting something that, that is dramatically different from uh, really. So for me, uh, with my experience, the item 19 is, is a key, key element. Uh, Paul mentioned litigation. Uh, again, because I've, I've always worked with the mature, uh franchisors, litigation is always is very important because it really helps you understand the philosophy of the company. You know, if, if a company has 20 pages of litigation listed, you usually want to question why, you know, how much of that is uh, is frivolous or not, and what were the reasons. If, on the other hand, there's very little, it, it, it helps you understand the psyche of the, com- of the company and how they deal with their, their franchise owners. And then maybe one other area that you want to look at, uh, again, I think it's uh, item 20, which is, you know, look at the past history of, of, the, of the franchisor, uh, not only looking at the growth, but also how many closed schools Per year, or over the last three years, as as indicated in, in the FTD, uh, I can say in the case of, of Goddard, over the last ten years, we have had eight schools closed, eight over a ten-year period. And despite the last three years of the of the economic recession, uh, is just phenomenal. So those are the areas you're looking at. And then, of course, you get all of that information as you're wor- working through with your franchise or then, uh, you know, the next part is to validate with your franchisees, but I know we'll get into that later. Speaking of validation, Chris, why don't why don't you touch on that? Because, I mean, one, you guys do a neat of validation by inviting franchise prospects to your convention. Talk about how an FDD can help on the validation part and, and on the due diligence of a brand. All right, Chris, Corey. 
Yeah. Chris, Chris Conley. Chris Conley. Let's keep it going. So, so Doug Dix, since you take that question, how can how can an FTD help on the due diligence of the brand and showcasing where to validate and all those good things? Yeah, um, yeah. The validation is a very important part, and that's that's a for those who aren't familiar with that terminology means it's um, when a franchisor um, provides names of existing franchisees for the uh, prospect to call um, to ask them questions about uh, you like to uh, to be a part of that system, and um, that's a, like I said, it's a critical piece of the whole process. And and I think what you need to do is if you let it. Um, uh, through the franchisor's eyes, they obviously want to have people in their system that are very positive and being very successful. Those are the ones they want you to talk to, and that's great, and I think you should talk to those folks as well. But I think it also, as a prospective franchisee, ask, can I speak with some of the other folks in your system? Look, a third, third, third strategy. Let me talk to two people in the top third. Let me talk to two people in the middle third. Maybe talk to two people in the bottom third. So you get a different perspective of what's going on in their system. I would also um, ask uh, if you, you can speak with somebody that's maybe coming from a similar background that you are. If you're coming from corporate America and you're new to this particular type of business, talk to somebody that's coming from that similar background. Um, and then, um, lastly, I would like to talk to a couple of the people that are terminated. Um, in the FDD, you'll see a list of, of the uh, the shops that have, have closed or terminated in the last year. And I would probably call a couple of those just to get a sense of what's going on and why they terminated. And the main question I'm asking is, is if you were in my shoes right now, would you make the same decision to go forward with this franchise concept? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Because you'll get some critical information by asking that question. Are all the FTDs at the Dwyer Group, are they are they all the same? Or are there, are there similarities across all the brands? I mean, when, when you guys are putting these together, are you trying to apply best practices across the board are, are the similarities the same with with all the brands? Well, it's a hard one to answer, Nick. They're they're similar but yet different. I mean, they're they are separate uh, organizations or companies, and so obviously they have their unique uh, aspects uh, in terms of the various the various parts of the FDD. But there are some things that that we do that's kind of standard boilerplate that we will use in an FDD that applies across all seven of our brands. So it's a it's a little bit of both. both. Yeah, and the reason I asked said CB, and if you just before we move on to the next question, obviously there, it's important to find someone who can connect with you and and help you understand what you're looking at because what Doug said is all FDDs are different. All FDDs are different, and you certainly want to build you know relationship with the franchise or the franchising licensing manager for the company or director of franchise sales, whoever you're dealing with, can really help you through the process. But as Harold mentioned earlier, in a lot of cases you want to get you know a franchise attorney who understands franchise law to really help you understand what you're signing, especially if you're signing you know a franchise agreement for ten years and committing yourself to financial obligations on your own business is very re rewarding. But at the same time, it also has you know risks and there are expenses involved. So you need to understand all of those, those things. The franchisor can help explain that to you as well, obviously a, a franchise attorney. Steve, I want to stay on you because the next question that we want to swing through, and as we have about 15 minutes left, I want to bring you kind of answer quickly on the next two. But when I conduct my due diligence, what should I expect to see? And obviously we've touched on it as the FDD has given us a great due diligence. But what do you see? I mean, it, and, and frankly, the Internet has changed the game that now you can log on Google and find everything you want about a brand, but what, what should I expect to see when I'm conducting my due diligence to make me feel comfortable? Steve, let me stay with you on that one. Well, the thing that you should do is in the FDD, it lists you know, all the franchisees, their names, their phone numbers, uh, their addresses. The first thing you know I would do is, is contact franchisees in, in the business and get a feeling and an understanding of their experience um, and what they've you know liked about the business, what the challenges were, how long it took them to get open, um, if the investment level was comparable to what was disclosed in the FTD document, all those things. Um, but you really want to get a good understanding of, of the costs and what the business is really like because the worst thing you could do is join a franchise system and two months in decide this is not what you really wanted to do. So make sure it's the right fit um, and start with due diligence through the franchisees 
Uh, that's the best thing. If you can, go visit some of their locations and meet the franchisees in person. That's ideal. But that's not always possible. And if you want to get a you know, sampling of franchisees and, and their experience, then you're going to obviously have to call franchisees and talk to them by phone. So starting by contacting franchisees is the first and foremost thing you could do in, in the due diligence side. So, Doug, when you're, when you're going through the due diligence, um, and you come across something that, that might not make a lot of sense. How important is it to ask the question to the franchisor? Because the answer there, you could be looking at the wrong brand anyway. But how important is it to come back through the due diligence and not to rely on what you read and go back to discussing some of those points? Uh, I think it's really important. If you, if you run across something that, that just uh, doesn't make sense to you or it doesn't jive, uh, I want to go back to the franchisor and get into that in a little more detail. Um, uh, also, if it's appropriate, raise that same question with any franchisees you're talking to to get um, you know a, a different viewpoint on it, um, because uh, you know and hopefully it'll start to triangulate where you'll get you'll get a true sense of what's going on. But uh, you need to be you know 100% comfortable with all aspects of the business that you're considering buying into because it's a big decision. And uh, Steve was saying you don't want to you don't want to uh, you don't want to make a bad decision or regret that later on. So um, do not be um, shy about asking questions, and as has been said a million times before, there's no such thing as a stupid question when you're making a decision like this. If you don't understand it, um, you find out and get the right answer. Well, Doug, I know, one of the things that you keep going back to is talk, talking with the existing franchisees or even, even ones who've been terminated. I mean, because obviously mm -hmm. you want the right franchisee coming in. Every franchise system goes through ups and downs. But just, just touch on that one more time because it, I have a prospect be going back to the franchise, or should maybe I stick out there with the franchisees that exist? Oh, uh, I think it's both. Yeah. When we, encur we encourage our folks to do both. We encourage them to talk to existing franchisees, but then we have an ongoing dialogue between franchise developers and that prospect uh, throughout the process to check in with them and make sure that they're uh, understanding uh, exactly what is involved because this is, we have a mutual evaluation process. We're we're evaluating them throughout the process to see if they're a good fit for us, but at the same time, they're evaluating uh, us to see if we're a good fit for them. Uh, kind of like a marriage, um, because we want this thing to be a, a long-term relationship, and we're you know, we're both on the same side of the table. If they're successful as a franchisee, then we're successful as a franchisor. So, um, you know, we go through the process at the rate at which they're comfortable. Uh, have their answers uh, answers to all their questions and feel very confident um, in that relationship going forward before we uh, sign uh, sign documents. Diane, before you became a franchisee, how how much time did you spend on due diligence? Oh, I spent an enormous time on due diligence. I mean, first of all, I wanted to look at my community and look at you know the the concept that I was interested in. I wanted to see if that concept you know is recession proof. So is this something that even, you know, if we're in a recession, that my concept will be successful and I'll continue to get business there? And then I wanted to look at the competition. What's the competition in my community? And um, as one of the participants mentioned earlier, um, Google is a wonderful thing. So you can get online and immediately Google, okay, this concept in this community and all of these, you know, enterprises will pop up that might meet that concept. So you need to understand what your competition is in the market. And by the way, a lot of competition in your market is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it might mean that it's a very good, wide-growing concept. So there might be a lot of room for a lot of participants to be successful in that community. So, so due diligence in those respects are really important. And, you know, you want to kind of look and see, you know, what the pricing is in your marketplace for that particular service. Can I make money, you know, competing at those price points? Um, so, so you want your due diligence not to only cover your brand but the overall market in general as you're looking at the concept. Chris Conley, are you back yeah. online, Chris? Can you hear, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear <laughs> that. The funny right. cell phone company just said, can I hear you now? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so – so, I mean, is is there too much time spent on due diligence? I mean, how quickly do you want a prospect to move and make a decision, or how much time should they be spending on their due diligence? When it comes to our business, we we really want to, and I can't touch over here. We like to slow them down because we want to make sure that they have a total understanding of what they're getting into, what the business is about, 
talked with as many franchisees as possible. You know, discovery day with us. We want to make sure, and, and uh, someone, someone said earlier, that you're the right fit for us and we're the right fit for you. It's a long-term relationship. Do this. You can't, I don't think you can spend enough time. You know, I'd rather have someone spend. The, the, the scary thing I've seen is that people that want to move don't even want to do it. Don't even want to do validation. Uh, you know, that could be a recipe for, for down the road because you may be walking into a, a business model that's not right for you. So, so due diligence is very important. So, Judy, when they're conducting due diligence on Anigo, um, do you help them? Do you say, here are the points that we want you to go look at or some of the franchisees that we want you to speak with? No, you know, Diane took the words right out of my mouth. First of all, I wanted to say it's very important to check out your competition and, and, and see in your particular area who you're competing against and what the marketplace is like. Regarding the validation, yes, we will suggest to them perhaps some masters to speak with, but <clears throat> due diligence process should go as fast or slow as someone wants it to. It's a personal journey. And yeah, I would call whoever the franchisor suggested, but I flip to the back of my FDD and look at the list of all the sub franchisees, and I'd pick some on my own to call. And should you always hear everything's great and wonderful? No, nothing in life is, is always great and wonderful. Someone before said it's like marriage between a franchisor and franchisee. You should be hearing good, bad, and ugly. It's just the degree of good, bad, and ugly that you hear that's, yep. that's important and what you should pay attention to. So, um, yes, we will suggest who they should speak to, but as a prospect, speak whoever you want to and take as much time as you need. It's a life-altering decision that you're making to purchase a business. So it should be at your speed, not at the franchisor's speed. Okay, and from so an online perspective, Terry, do you want to touch on some of the benefits and, and even negatives of how the online search has impacted due diligence? Sure. Um, you know, obviously with the Internet today, there's tons of information. I mean, you know, mostly good, you're going to find some bad. Uh, and I think the key thing that you should get is, you know, once you've made a decision that you're going to go into a business, whatever it may be, and you're with the franchisor, and you come across information as negative. I think the, the right thing to do is, is keep the communication lines open. Uh, are you looking for a reason not to buy the franchise, or are you, are you just looking for answers that can help you with your decision? And, uh, you know, address it with the franchisors and speak to them about it. And, uh, Terry, and one, right thing, one thing Judy mentioned was competition. So one of the nice resources that you have on, on your site is you come there and you can basically identify the competitors in the field. You'd be looking at FDs or, or even talking with franchisees from the competitors in the industry that you're trying to pick, or should you fly and say, all right, if I'm going into uh, the seller industry, I only want to talk with, with wireless zone. Should you diversify search or should you limit it? Well, I, I think initially you, you, you want to diversify it, and I think, uh, you know, too much information is not a bad thing, although at some point it can be. But, no, I think you need to diversify and speak to two or three people in, in that type of an industry um, you know, and find what their methods of business is and how, how you fit in and how you feel comfortable. And that's, that's going to be one of the key decisions you're going to make is after you speak with them, who, who do I feel comfortable with? Who has the right brand? Who has the right system? Who has the right support programs in place? And the only way to find that out is, is by talking to a few different companies. Yep, that's cool. So I want to jump kind of to ask question because we've touched on so much avail brand validation. So um, with the few minutes left, I think it's important for a prospect to hear because you're deciding on the brands, you're picking the brands that make sense for you, you're picking the industry, you understand how to look, look through the FDD. But now to hear, I want to go back to a question that, that I want our franchisors and um, our experts to kind of just quickly touch on in a quick 30-second answer. But tell me, why, why do you love franchising? What is the beauty of it? And why should a prospect be looking at franchising as an option. So let's start with you, Diane. Why do you love franchising? Franchising, and I was a previous franchisee, so I can tell you I like it because the franchisor takes a lot of the burden off of an owner so that you can focus on going and starting up your business. If you have someone there that's helping with the marketing, the advertising, they've got the umbrella set up, a, a, a proven a proven umbrella of services that will help you get your business up and rolling, and a proven success ratio, 
um, that's really important so that you can focus on getting your business up and started and growing, creating revenue plans, and working your business instead of working in your business. That's why I like franchise. Love it. Tony, why do you love franchising? I love it because it, it's a candidate, an opportunity. You know, the old cliched answer is, well, it allows you to go into business for yourself, not by yourself. But it really is true because when you get into franchising, you're looking at a franchisor that, that through its experience, through its growth, has already made most of the mistakes that you would encounter as a new uh, business owner. It so allows you to buy into and benefit from a, a proven a proven system, a proven uh, a series of processes that really are all meant to one maximize your 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 uh, opportunities for success and obviously minimize the risk. And it's all and and then it all comes down to passion. You have to be passionate about what you're doing. I've been doing this. Uh, I keep I keep saying over 30 years, but I still uh, am as passionate about it today as a franchisor because what what gives me the most satisfaction is when I see new franchisees, regardless of what businesses I've worked for, uh, see them succeed and then come to not so much succeed, but say, you know, come back and thank you and thank you for what you're able to provide to them. So as a candidate, you're really looking for, for you know, that strong franchisor where you really can benefit from the stability of their system, uh, that they have an infrastructure in place, that they're growth-minded, that, you know, they have a proven history, and you're learning from their expertise. And that's Gerald. Why do you love franchising? Because when I'd be an unemployed attorney, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it, it's just a great business model. And and you know, I have a son who's who's an employed teacher who I think the next step that he's going to take is going to probably be to buy a franchise because otherwise he will still be living at home and be unemployed. So yeah, I think it's a great business model. Harold, um, Doug, why do you love franchising? Uh, other, beyond what's been said already, to me, it's the power of large numbers. I mean, to, you know, through a franchise system, we're all stronger. We can all be more effective. We share information. We can share best practices. Um, we can use collective purchasing power to buy supplies and services at a better price than anybody could get on their own because of the size of the business. We take advantage of that system to help others be more successful and uh, I guess maybe it was Tony that was talking about just increasing the chances of success as a new business. Um, uh, you know, when you're rolling the dice to buy a new business. That's a for most people, that's a big, big decision and a big financial investment. And um, if you lower the risk that's involved in that, boy, franchising is one of the ways to do that, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, Chrisley, why do you love franchising? I mean, love franchising just because it, it allows me to help people. Uh, get into something that they uh, are passionate about. You know, it's, it's, you know, getting into the oil industry is a uh, is not any, uh, e it's not an easy thing to do, and it allows me to help people get in with a premium brand, with a proven business model, a proven system, and want to grow. Um, you know, I've been I work on both the carrier side and franchising side, and I uh, the impact of uh, individuals that try to do it without the without the support system or the sharing of best practices is very difficult, and that's what you know. With, I'm able to see that every year at our convention, see that brought in that are looking to grow or come up and like someone else that's to come and thank thank you know, thank thank me for helping them through the process of getting into owning their own business. That's great, Chris Corey, you love franchising. Uh, just just because it's a way to grow a brand and a concept collectively with with uh, business owners that share the same passion and vision. You think teamwork? I'm a big believer in it. Teamwork and uh, you know the synergies uh, provide benefits. A lot of uh, franchisors have mentioned that on the call today. It makes a lot of sense. Strength in numbers is a great way to do it. And ultimately, being able to uh, utilize a collaborative learning system, growing together, learning together, uh, all focused on one mission. I think is, is a, a huge uh, value. And the theory, why do you love franchising? Plan theory, you there? Can you, can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I can. Go, go ahead. It evens a playing field. It gives everyone out there an opportunity to get in their own business, uh, you know, uh, whether they have a low investment, uh, low investment,
investment as far as getting into it or a high investment. I mean, I think there's a lid for every pot, and it gives everyone the opportunity to be successful and, uh, you know, improve their lives. Yeah, that's great. Why do you love franchising? Judy? Yes, I'm here. Oh, um, Go ahead. All the, all the answers that were given before, proven system, you're buying a plug-and-play um, well, the mistakes have already been made for you. But I think one of the most important things is going into business with experts in that particular field. You're not going into business by yourself. At Anago, our motto is we are here for our franchisees, and they are our only business. So you are going into business with a total support team that's there to guide you and hold your hand every step of the way. And that's the beauty of franchising. That's great. And lastly, Steve Beagleman, why do you love franchising? Something just gives people so many different opportunities. I mean, there are franchise businesses in every type of industry. People on the call today from the senior care industry, the, you know, the cleaning industry, the service businesses, child education. There's so many different opportunities out there, and, and you know, really that's what makes business great. And franchising really allows people to get into the business a business, follow their passion and their dream, but follow that proven system. I mean, everything that everybody said from Doug, Tony, Diane, everybody really covered it. And, you know, really what, what franchising does is it allows people, like Harold was saying, you know, his son has been out of work, so what he wants to do, ultimately what's going to probably end up happening is he's going to buy a franchise. He probably can't create his own concept, but wants to follow a proven system, wants to be passionate about something, and wants some direction and obviously has to make a decision with what investment level he's comfortable with, what kind of industry he's interested in, and all of those things. But franchising gives people the opportunity to follow that dream, get in their own business, but at least have the support of a franchisor behind them. That's why I love franchising. Great. Well, obviously you guys have got to get a lot of information on today's call. Um, we have another one at 2 p.m., so so if you feel you want more information, we have a different set of franchisors that will be talking on the topics that we went over today at 2 p.m., along with our experts who uh, do every webinar with me. Um, obviously, as you leave here, you need to decide your decision is, uh, the, the decision criteria of the industry that you want to go to. You need to commit to the process, which we've talked to, that you have to follow a system as, as to how you're doing your due diligence, what franchisees you're talking to, Working with the franchisor, you got to talk with the franchisees, as everyone's mentioned today. You got to do your homework, then make a decision. You got to have, have an exit plan. What, what? Why are you doing this? Where do you want to get out of this? What do you want to get out of this? Have all those in order, um, and obviously um, take all this and build upon it. And hopefully, this will help you on your journey. Going from here, if you have any questions, I'm gonna just quickly go out. You obviously could write down the contact information on the bottom of the screen, but there's Diane, Tony. Corey, Chris Conley, Doug, and Judy, um, thank you all for joining today's webinar. Um, feel free to email any of our participants or myself, and we will be sure to help you out. Thank you, everyone, for thank you. today's call. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.